Hi there, welcome back to the Mindful Money Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Dio. I wanted to start uh, today's podcast out with a little bit of appreciation. A listener, KLP, went to ratethispodcast.com forward slash mindful money and wrote that the Mindful Money Podcast was, I'm gonna read this here, a new podcast that shows signs of being both super helpful and wise. The first episode with George Kinder was enlightening. She used the word enlightening. I'll be sharing it with my clients. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to visit ratethispodcast.com forward slash mindful money and drop a review. It really does help us out and helps us get the word out about the podcast. Thanks so much. So in this episode of the Mindful Money Podcast, I'm chatting with Mark Silver. Mark started out in 1999 helping entrepreneurs create authentic marketing programs that felt good to them. After being introduced to Sufi-based healing work, the heart of business was born in 2001. Since then, he's been building an entrepreneurial heart wisdom curriculum and helping good people build sustainable businesses. Mark, welcome to the Mindful Money Podcast. I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. Thanks for being here. So just to set the stage, I know we talked a little bit beforehand. Where where do you call home? Where are you connecting from today? Yeah, I'm in central Pennsylvania, outside Harrisburg, in uh, beautiful York County on a really beautiful piece of property. We just planted some fruit trees. Sweet. And are you from Pennsylvania or are you from someplace else? No, I'm from Maryland. It's the same. I'm from this watershed. I'm about two hours. I grew up about two hours from here. And interestingly, my wife grew up two hours from here in a different direction. And so, but we've only landed here relatively recently, you know, not to make it long, but I've, I spent time on the West Coast and, and then in central New York before we ended up here. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can, you can provide any structure to this you'd like, but I see kind of two areas of your work that I'd like to get into first. And I think for the majority of your career, you've worked with business, small business, micro business entrepreneurs helping them establish businesses, create systems and grow. Yes. And then second, more recently, you've created a course called, and I apologize if I get this wrong, the heart of money and power transformational journey, where you're sort of helping people identify and overcome fears and judgments about money, and then clear the way for life and financial success. Yeah, that's mostly accurate. The, the the only thing that's different is like the nascent version of Heart of Money was born in 2002, really almost the first thing that got created when I was in my healership training and my assistant, who was also in the training said, I have some friends who are struggling with money. Can you put in a put a course together? And I'm like, I don't know, let's see what happens. So, and that has had a wonderful 20 year run and it's deepened and grown and expanded and evolved like all things do, but it's the essential teachings are many of them are the same because they weren't my teachings. They came from the Sufi lineage. So many of the spiritual teachings are hundreds of years old. Yeah. So before the spiritual team, take us back to the beginning, like when you were growing up, did you learn anything about money, financial success, entrepreneurship, and were there any sort of moments of, you know, aha? That, that you know, you yeah. There, well, so <laughs> I grew up in entrepreneurship. My parents ran a store that had been my grandfather's. <laughs> this is a, a fun story is that my grandfather was a pharmacist. He was an Orthodox Jewish immigrant from Russia. He and my grandmother both in the extreme, like very early 1900s, around the turn of this, that century. And then happened, and then with prohibition, they were selling, he was selling alcohol by prescription. <laughs> and then when prohibition ended, he opened a wine store. And so that was the family business. And I grew up around that. And my mom was always starting small businesses. The, the, but, you know, strangely enough, you know, money was a real taboo subject in my family. We never, my parents never discussed money. We never talked about it. I had to really learn about money much, much later um, in life. One of the aha moments entrepreneurially and money-wise, which was an interesting one, is that I ended up in that, I don't even know if it still exists, junior achievement, that, you know, school-based, like, entrepreneurial organization. And, you know, normally you make these cup holders, you know, and sell them. And I had the bright idea that, you know, let's, let's just be the middleman. Let's go to a t-shirt making company and let's go to clubs and say, Hey, you guys probably want t-shirts. And then we just brokered deals between them. And our JA chapter was incredibly successful. Like I forget the percentage, but like, like 2000% over anything close by. And we actually made money, you know, more than $3. And the aha moment I had was that, ah, 
business is a bit of a scam. And it kind of launched me into like, this is like, we didn't do any work and we made money. And it was kind of a spark in my activism around all kinds of things. But it was, it's kind of like, it woke, it, it was like the very first awakenings to huh, there's something not quite right in late stage capitalism, <laughs> which <laughs> I have strong critiques of despite teaching in business and working in business for a long time. Well, there's a difference between, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later. There's a difference between the small business, micro business, local business, and the global enterprise. Oh uh, yes, <laughs> there is, <laughs> there is, uh, there is. And unfortunately, so many small business owners don't have any other template. To, I mean, now they do, but it's like, it's been, it was something that a lot of, I know that when I first started, a lot of people struggled because the only, they saw how big companies were doing things. It's like, I have to do it that way, you know? And anyway, that's another, t you know, there's, so that was really kind of like an opening for me, that moment in life among, you know, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds like the, the journey of business come, it came pretty naturally to you, but there's also this questioning of what's the value you provide. And that's, I think, important for every entrepreneur. Yeah. And what are the values you're going to live by and what's, you know, yeah. What, like, what are you actually doing exactly? Right. So can you define for us the heart of business? So heart of business. So I have to go a little spiritual with you on this one because the, it. the real meaning of it, I'll go just straight to the core of it. The heart of business is in Sufi spiritual terms, like everything is an expression of the divine, of oneness, of the source of love. Everything comes from love and everything returns to love. And the Sufis talking about something like the heart is the definition of, is where the locus of connection is. Like in the human being, the heart is how, from a Sufi point of view, of course, is how we connect to the oneness, how we connect to the infinite. And everything that exists has a heart. And the business, you're, you know, a business has a heart. And one of the exercises we do, and it's, is we have people listen, like communicate, you know, in meditation, in prayer, in, you know, inwardly with the heart of their business. And people get really stunningly interesting, insightful information about the business. And I think one of the deepest things is just that the business is not them. It's separate from them. And it, it's really important when you're a solo, self-employed, as many of our clients are, not all of them, but many of them are, and they need to see the business as something separate so that one, the business can grow and develop and become something that can carry them to some extent and can carry the business even when they're not there. And it's, and so that's often a profound realization. Of course, the less profound meaning of it is just that we want to live from the heart. We want, you know, love is important. Care is important. The heart is important in business and to leave it out, I think is deadening and just a stunning mistake on so many levels. So I, I'm imagining, and I, I went to the website, so I saw that it's a reference like 4,000 businesses, but I think the website, that number probably isn't up to date. So it's more than that would be my guess. Right. How many different narratives do you run into? And coming from this, the earlier comment of, you know, business doesn't have to be evil, you know, late stage capitalism problems, you know, huge global enterprise problems. But if you're just a micro business and you're operating inside your local mm -hmm. environment, serving mm -hmm. the local community, do you still think that the people starting those businesses have this business is evil narrative? And then, yes. and then well, yeah. what, yeah. Yeah, what's I, your well, to that? Well, so people have a very natural and justified reaction, negative re reaction to business because business has done terrible things. Like we can look at global businesses, but we can also look at smaller businesses. Like even though, you know, like the, 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 you know, the old trope of like, you know, the used car salesmen or, you know, other businesses that just don't feel like they're, you know, caring for us. You know, we've been dealt badly on many, many occasions and businesses tend to make these decisions profit first rather than caring for things you know, caring for the community or caring for the world around them. And so people have that in them. Like people, it's a very natural experience born narrative. I come across very few people that 
don't carry that to some extent and often to a very great extent. And yeah, and so there's often not a getting over that or a healing that, but what I say is that you can trust your heart, like you're sensing something real. Business has done terrible things. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to do business from the heart with integrity, still be successful, still, you know, you still want to provide for yourself. You still, you know, need to make money and pay the mortgage and retirement and all of those things. But you can do that without following in the footsteps of morally and ethically bankrupt business practices. Yeah, I, I my in the earliest points of my career, I mean, I started financial services on Wall Street. So, uh, you know, ah. I was <laughs> belly of the beast. In years, horrible. And I almost quit, you know, a dozen times. And I had a, a mentor. His name was Ernie Guzman. And he took me aside and said, Hey, you don't have to do it this way. You can do it your way. And so it took me a five more years to get out of Wall Street and start my own firm. But the whole idea of, yes, business sometimes is bad, but you don't have to be bad. You know, that's not you. You can have your business and you can do it your way. That's a critical lesson, I think. Do you think that people learn that quickly or is that a really difficult one to get across? Well, I, I mean, it's hard to generalize because people have different rates of learning depending on, you know, what their history is and where they're coming from and what else they're walking with. But I think it, it does. It takes it. Our education system is built on obedience, not on thinking you know, not on proud, you know, true problem solving or creative problem solving. It's built on obedience, you know, do this, do this amount of homework, do the, you know, answer the questions correctly. And there's not a lot of room for other ways of thinking. And so there is often a real learning, you know, what's the, <laughs> I'm fasting for Ramadan. So my vocabulary <laughs> feels a little attenuated at the moment, but you know, there's a real learning edge around being able to embrace your sovereignty, being able to embrace the fact that, oh, this really is your business and you can make your own choices. And, you know, there's always some caution there about like not wanting to make big mistakes, especially when your survival, financial survival is at stake. But this deeper sense of like, oh, I really can do what I want. Like I really can. Yeah create it exactly how I want to create it, as long as I'm okay with the consequences and, you know, can problem solve for that. It's really tremendous. And, but it does take time to sink in and it often takes some practice. You know, people will try something and they're like, oh, the sky didn't fall in. Okay. Let me try this. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Oh, I really am the captain. I really can do whatever I want. It seems to me a little bit that some of the stuff you talk about is really applicable to a service-based business, coaching, you mm -hmm. know, tax, maybe services, maybe legal services, maybe financial services, but right. really servicing. Do you find, or do you have many clients that are product manufacturers or, you know, small product manufacturers? No, or, or... we really do have a niche. That's our, I mean, our focus is small service-based businesses. I have worked occasionally with companies that produce a product. And sometimes some of our businesses, some of our clients also will produce a product, but it's pretty rare for us to work directly with a product based business. It's, I think the principles are often the same, but I don't have the institutional knowledge around you know, there's mm -hmm. just way different kinds of, of things you have to pay attention to around profit margins and cost of materials right. and supply chains that I'm not nearly as familiar with. I'd want someone who's working, like I, having grown up in retail, which is different, but similar to product production, it's like, it's such a slim profit margin that you're dealing with that you really want to know. Somebody really needs to know that side of yeah. things to be able to yeah. not steer someone in the wrong direction. You know, I'm going to shift a little bit because something you quote, you said something to me in an email that I read it probably a dozen times. This is a mm -hmm. sentence. And I know that, or you know, that I'm working with people on the micro decisions they make the, to make, you know, better personal financial outcomes. That's mm -hmm. my goal with this podcast. And in this email, you wrote this, and I'm just going to read this real quick. So anyone with heart would have issues with money in this culture. It's done so dysfunctionally and painfully. The important thing is to not turn away, but lean in and find the love. Can you develop that a little bit? And then mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask a couple follow-ups. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like that's the, in many ways, the heart of our teaching in many different, you know, one trick pony and many different versions. But so for an example, 
if you're, let me come up with a, let me land on a good decision, on a good example. So, you know, one of the things that we really talk a lot about in business and and well, in money is people will have reaction around debt, for instance, you know, like Mm, in the heart of, in the heart of anyone teaching, like people will have like, you know, they'll feel powerless, they'll feel overwhelmed. It'll be really painful and they'll just go, oh my God, my debt. And they'll, there'll be like this kind of a stance is what I often notice, you know, this kind of an energetic stance or kind of this, you know, kind of like in a fetal position or holding your hands out, kind of blocking things away and turning away from it is kind of how a lot of people deal with it. And what I encourage people to do, it's like the way the debt is done, you know, like in the United States, student debt is predatory and terrible and keeps people from living their lives and hurts the economy in all kinds of ways. Credit card companies are, you know, outright evil in terms of how they run things. Like there's, there's so many different examples we could get into. And so the resistance and the experience is true, right? Debt can be really painful, but however, turning away from it doesn't help. And so one of the practices that we have people do in the class is say, okay, well, list out the different debts and commitments you have, uh, liabilities, and lean in and look at them individually in your heart and see. And what they often notice is that, oh, there are some that I actually don't have a reaction to, but there are some Hmm. that carry a lot of emotional load, you know, like, oh, I have a lot of a load around this student debt because it's really enormous and I'm not even working in my field. And no matter how much I pay, it doesn't go down. Or they'll have something like, oh, I've got this debt and... I got an inheritance when my father died and I was, you know, only a young adult and I spent all the money and then ended up running a credit card up. And so I have all the grief from my dad in that credit card. You know, it's like there's, we have these things tangled in. And so when you take the time to actually look and see what's going on, there's a chance for healing and there's a chance to say, okay, so what does my heart need so that I can have a healthier relationship with this debt, because actions arise for me, the way that we teach, the way I understand is actions arise out of relationship. If you have an unhealthy relationship, you'll be making unhealthy decisions, taking unhealthy actions. But if you have Mm. a healthier relationship, then you can make healthier decisions and you can take healthier actions that will move you in a direction that you want to go in. So I find myself agreeing with everything and that there's something in the back of my mind that that I want to pick at a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I agree that our various reactions to like our heavily financialized culture are often dysfunctional and totally natural. Like we shouldn't, no one should be judged or shamed for having issues with money, right? Right. And I also wanna be leery of imbuing money with too much like animating force. Like money, I don't think money pushes (laughs) us to employ X or Y behavior. I think it's, you know, it's inanimate and it absorbs and displays our internal fears and concerns more than pushes us to do things. Well, I think yes and no. So first, the yes part is that in our class, you know, in that course, we have people, like I want people to see that money exists as a physical thing. You know, it can hold any number of different energies. It's not more or less important than any any other physical thing in the world. Yes, I agree with you at an essential level. The problem is, is that our culture has system, systemic issues in place that mean that money is different for different groups of people. And it's different. And it just, it's in terms of access, in ter- it's not, I think if one of the big errors in Western culture, which also is not something I'd want to get rid of completely because it's, there's some beautiful qualities in it, but we're so individualistic and we heap mm. responsibility on the individual to an extent that isn't true. It's just like, that's, it's not true. You know, it's like you, when you spend, when you have somebody who's very young, their brain's still growing and you say, go go to college, go to college, go to college. And then they go to college and then they end up with a debt. And some people have family resources or other resources and they get then those debts get discharged or they never get racked up in the first place, as opposed to, you know, other people who don't have access, generational poverty, or they don't have access to like, to loans that have as good a rate, or they, you know, because of racism or sexism, they get paid a lot less and they don't have access to higher paying jobs. So paying down the debt is harder. There's a lot of institutional and systemic problems that cannot be 
overcome purely by individual effort and mindset changes. So yes, I totally recognize that that's true and with an individual, you know, you're mm -hmm. coaching an individual entrepreneur, you know, micro entrepreneur, yeah. right? Do you have to approach that differently depending upon, you know, that person's experience or do you apply the same framework? And then that person has to kind of learn and do and become because there are some simple, basic things about running a business that everyone kind of has to. Well, do. I mean, again, it's a yes. And right. It's like, yeah, yeah. so yeah, the principles that we teach have been successfully applied by people from all different cultures, from all, many different continents and countries and, and societies we've had clients from the Middle East. We've had clients all over Europe. We have clients from Africa and we've had, you know, clients in Asia and it resonates, you know, like these, the teachings and the principles resonate at the heart level and people express such a deep sense of relief when we acknowledge these institutional and systemic issues that they're facing, that it's not like, oh, okay, here's another white guy telling me that I can do it right. no matter what, when they haven't really faced the crap I faced. And it's like, yeah, you're facing a lot of crap. And that's really like, that's a weight that you're carrying. And let's really acknowledge that and not assume that everybody's on a level playing field because it's not true. The principles and the basic pieces do, you know, have successfully worked. But because they're based in principles, it leaves the it leaves a lot of creativity and stretch in the application of them so that they can look different in different situations. Well, I think you said the two sides of it there that I think are really important. I think there is, we all have a different starting point and yet there are things. And so there may be some things that I need to do before I can get to the beginning of the principles of business. But for me to actually get to the end of the successful business of having a successful business and you know hiring people you know having something that actually supports my lifestyle and my family in the future i have to begin and we may have to do some some work before i can begin and so i may be behind but i can catch up it's just it becomes challenging when we say systemic what's, not that what, it's not what, true but what, it takes what's challenging what's the chat what do you see as the challenge in in saying that I'm curious. No, no. So it's, it's not that it's a challenge to say it. It's regardless of whether there are systemic issues in place or not, the things that the individual has to do to be successful, the individual has to do, right? And so we can collectively do a lot better, but I can't personally affect that collectivism, right? Like on a national level, I can on a, in a local level and I do, and I do my best at that. But when you're coaching an individual, you're coaching that individual's next behavioral step. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I don't disagree with that. And part of it, I think, is that people aren't necessarily just acting individually. Like well, the heart of one of our offers is our learning community, where there's a group of people mm. that can lean into Great. each other and get support from one another. And so I think that, you know, it's an interesting point. And it's often one of the concerns that I've heard sometimes people raise where it's like, oh, and I don't know if you're saying this exactly, maybe saying something different, but it's like where, oh, you know, if we deal with that, like, is that going to somehow obscure their ability to really do what needs to be done? Or are they going to, you know, put the blame on a system and not take responsibility for what needs to be done. And I know you're, that's probably more, I'm sure that's not what you were saying, but I get, that's kind of like a really extreme version of where it goes when you start going, okay, well, you know, we got to be careful talking about systemic pieces. I guess my experience in acknowledging the systemic piece is that people tend to feel way more empowered. They feel more empowered because they feel seen. I think so often society is gaslighting individuals by saying, yep. oh, you know, you just got to do the same. We've all got the same thing in front of us to do. If you just did it, you'd be successful. But when we can really acknowledge, like, for instance, we were talking today, I was talking in a small group and one of the members of the group was bringing up something. We were talking about, you know, being direct. And, you know, she was saying, like, if I'm direct, I get called, a, I don't know. It's, okay. If we use bad words on yeah, the podcast, ahead. I don't know how it's rated. Yeah, you know, I get called a bitch. And I said, that's sexism. That's not individual. Yep. That's 
you getting treated differently because I don't get called a bitch when I'm direct. You know, I'm admired for my directness. And so what do we need to do to support you? What kind of support needs to get put in place so that doesn't undermine your forward movement? Like we need to account for that. It's unfortunate extra emotional right. labor. I mean, unfortunate yeah. is such an understatement, but it's like by accounting for that, then what we can do is we can start to work around, we can create systems of support, communities of support so that she can be super successful because she can be and she will be and she has been in the past. And so many of our clients carry these kinds of things. You know, they carry their chronic illness or trauma or single moms or queer community or trans. There's a lot of folks who, you know, who just have pieces of their life that are not in you know, are not often represented or accounted for in mainstream culture. And being an entrepreneur is a wonderful way to kind of forge your own path when, you know, work situations are not very equitable and also sometimes just needing more flexible time than often jobs allow, but it also needs to account for these other pieces. I think that's one of the reasons I love the work of entrepreneurial coaches or business coaches is you are empowering people to take control of their futures, right? Mm -hmm. To no longer rely on someone else's judgment of their ability. Not saying you can get rid of all the challenges, not saying you can get rid of mm -hmm. all the things that people have right. come across or diffuse any of their past. You can't do that, but you're saying here, let's chart a path forward that's in your control. And for me in working with people, one of the things I, I believe wholeheartedly is and the statistics, the wealth and inequality statistics bear this out, right? The difference maker is equity ownership. You know, those who own yes. their own businesses, own shares, own real estate, they are building wealth. Those who don't are not. Right. So by, by being an entrepreneurial coach, you're actually helping people build wealth. And I think that's fantastic. That's absolutely the hope. That's absolutely the hope. And yes, and it's delightful to see that, you know, come to fruition, you know, to take root and, and grow. So yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's so beautiful because people feel so empowered. Like they, when they do embrace their sovereignty and they do realize they can make the business exactly how they want, and they can make these decisions from love and care without leaving themselves out of the equation. Right. And they can do things with integrity. It's just, it's such a, I feel so humbled witnessing that happen over and over again. Tell us one of your success stories. Like you worked with somebody that was, they had, they had a good idea, but they're really hesitant. And you said, Hey, let's chart this path. Let's work together. And they became and built something that, you know, built wealth for their family. Yeah. So let's see, we have, gosh, there's a, <laughs> all these stories from rushing in. <laughs> so just to be clear, mostly we work with people who have already tried and started you know, my specialty is not helping people come up with the idea. Like they've already got something that they're like, and they're like struggling, you know, and because right. there's no MBA for these micro businesses. In fact, an MBA does not help <laughs> build a business at that size. People usually thrash around quite a bit before they get going. But what I've seen, I've seen people. So there was someone who, um, an acupuncturist who living in a major city, who's really struggling very, you know, making very low five figures, very low five figures, which in any major metropolitan area is not making it. They were burnt out. They were afraid that they were really burnt out with the work. They were afraid that they were really going to just need to give up. And we helped them kind of, we helped them kind of see like, what are the pieces that they can let go of? Where do they really need to focus? And then step-by-step step put things in place. And this was not an overnight success. In fact, one of the things that I really try to drum into people is the sense of compassionate patience that taking a business from what I call the first stage of business development all the way into momentum is often a two, three, four, five year process. You know, if you're trying to do it in six months or a year, there's just a certain amount of iteration that's needed that just can't be compressed into that short of a time period. And so over the course of, I think it was three, four years, she went from low five figures up into the six figures per year, able to take vacation, able to do professional development, able to think about having family. It was just like the breathe, like 
and just and like year by year just to see more room created and more room created i have another client who started out basically at scratch and had started to put our pieces in place and started to get little bits of momentum but then her spouse got a job in a new city and they had to totally move and so like for this long period of time couldn't really focus on business development but we helped them kind of like just keep doing the minimum like it's nothing like you already had kids already had all these things and so it kind of strips away and like okay here's the essentials to focus on just this just this very little step by step by step and then they landed and then just a couple of months after totally full with clients because they'd been just ticking away at these little, little pieces. Now, still in the kind of middle part of the journey. And so there's more support systems and things that need to be put into place to make it a really robust business, but they're going to get there because that's, it's just a matter of time because the kind of focus and care and self-care that they brought in during that time period was just extraordinary. I was really impressed. I'm going to use that phrase, compassionate patience, because I think that applies to so many things. You know, mm -hmm. apply it to your relationship with your spouse, relationship with your kids, you know, all your relationships at work, your business success, your investment portfolio, just that compassionate patience. You know, anytime you try to rush this stuff, it just doesn't work, right? It you doesn't can't work. rush it. It doesn't work. I, that's, I think that there's a tremendous sense of urgency that's been put on us that yeah. is a lie. It's just a lot. That's that cultural baggage right there. That's huge cultural oh, baggage. Right, right. You can be successful 20 years from now just by taking small steps today. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say, I want you, thanks for coming on. We're getting pretty close to the end here. I do have a couple like pretty traditional wrapping questions. I mean, these might be spins for you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them. What was the last thing you changed your mind about? What was the last thing I changed my mind about? So recently... So I mentioned earlier, I'm fasting for Ramadan. I've been, this is like my 22nd Ramadan I've been in. And, you know, months and months ago, my boys, I've got young teen boys and they wanted to go to Comic-Con in Pittsburgh and uh, this past weekend. And they're super into pro wrestling. So hilarious. Awesome. Anyway, we went and there is an exemption in Ramadan around fasting saying that if it's a traveler's exemption, like if you travel more than 50 miles in a day, you don't have to fast and you can make it up after you can make up that fast day after. And I was thinking, God, that, you know, that's for a different time and place. Like we're going to be driving in a car. But then I was talking with my coach and just seeing like I was being unnecessarily harsh to myself. Like that exemption is there and it's totally fine. And we had a great time and I didn't fast those two days and I picked up the fast. And so I changed my mind around because I was really set on trying to fast at Comic-Con, which it just, it ended up being such a compassionate embrace of reality that, um, that it was really a win for me and for my boys. Like they got me instead of like me at like 50% capacity. <laughs> so. right. That's great. Did your boys fast with you or, or no? No, no, they're not fasting. Okay. I'm just curious. I'm a Buddhist and I try to get my kids to sit with me and they did for a little while, but not so much anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. They'll, they'll <laughs> you know, find their own path. <laughs> as they, exactly. as they... We have to go to support them in their path. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that you, that people don't know, or maybe just don't remember about you that's really important to you that they know? That's so interesting. I'm not even sure how to approach that question. That's so interesting. What would be important that I would want someone else to know? I don't, I, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I love life. I think life can be tremendous fun. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, love is at the heart of it all. And for me, I try to remember that every day and I often forget and then I often remember, but in terms of something about me, I don't know if we ever, you know, yeah. You kind of, just, I don't know if you just answered it, but it, it's like, there's this thing you believe and sometimes you forget. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so have patience with me, right? Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate you coming on. This is a great conversation. The fact that your kids go to Comic-Con and, and, and you support that, I, I love that. You know, I'm a small partner in a retail game store and that's the kind of stuff. Oh, that you we are. Do. <laughs> that's awesome. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm like, my, my kids are so into pro wrestling and I'm, one of my kids, the other one, I don't think would do it, but the other one of them, I'm rooting to get into Dungeons and Dragons. Cause that's the, the only way I would spend that much time at this point in my life doing that is if 
one of my kids took it up. So anyway, we'll see if I can get him to do that. <laughs> That's a whole other episode right there. I, I have a, my Sunday group. I've been playing for years. That's I took awesome. a long 20 year break. And getting after my brother died last year, I'm back with the same group of friends I played with before. So mm. very, very cool. Anyway, tell us how people can find your work and connect with you. Yeah. Heartofbusiness.com. Just like it sounds, heartofbusiness.com. There's all kinds of free stuff on the website, including if you go under the free tab, there's an, a business assessment. You can assess your business according to the stages of development and helps you know where to focus. So you're not trying to do a thousand things at one time, which is really not so helpful. <laughs> Yeah. I'll put all that in the show notes. Is there any place where you actually connect with other people, email or social media or anything like that? Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Yeah. You're more than welcome to connect with us through the website. It's there. In fact, if you fill out the assessment, most assessments get a personal reply if I don't get too overwhelmed with them. And yeah, always delighted to hear from people. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for being on the Mindful Money podcast. It's been a great joy and we'll have all this stuff in there and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Really glad. Thank you for having me.